Good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Jackman Show. I am Paul Prescott. Jen has a night off, so we are actually joined by our great producer, young Kale. Kale, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm happy to, to co-host tonight. Uh, this is, um, I feel like over the last few weeks, uh, especially on weekends, I've just been talking more and more about why socialists should be scientific. And so uh, it was only right to finally do a Jacobin show episode on scientific socialism. Um, right. so I'm very happy to, to be joined in a little bit by Lee Phillips, good friend of the show. Uh, and just like Mr. Jacobin Science, he, he is right. our premier <laughs> scientific socialist, if I do say so. <laughs> and uh, Kale's actually doing a um, virtuoso performance tonight because he's also producing at the same time. Um, but also stick around because we have um, a worker from Sh Chicago, Cook County, um, SCIU Local 73 has been on strike for a few weeks. Um, so we're going to be interviewing one of the strike leaders there. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Um, but I figured I would start you know, speaking of science, you know, in case we all forgot, this past week has really reminded us that we've, we're in an urgent climate crisis that is only getting worse. You have a brutal heat wave in the Northwest, a heat wave in the Northeast. You, you see uh, videos now of infrastructure literally melting because of the heat, and you have the ocean literally on fire. So we need all hands on deck to address the climate issue, and we need to consider all options available. And so in this spirit, I kind of want to highlight a recent article by Jackman founding and editor Bhaskar Sankar that was in The Guardian recently, where he makes the case for nuclear energy to be a big component of the way we cut CO2 emissions. So this is, of course, a very controversial topic among the left um, and the environmental movement. And I'll admit, you know, I'm not that knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. And for a long time, I believed that nuclear really is just too dangerous to be thought of as a major way to combat climate change. But my thinking has changed and evolved on this over time. And I think we should seriously consider some of the points in this article. So, you know, this article comes on the heels of the um, Indian, power, Indian Point nuclear power plant in New York being shut down. So for years, that plant provided the vast majority of New York City's carbon-free energy, not to mention it employed a lot of unionized workers. So since it got shut down, there's already been an big increase in CO2 emissions. So in the article, he points out the first full month without the plant has seen a 46% increase in the average carbon intensity of statewide electric generation compared to when Indian Point was fully operational. New York replaced clean energy from Indian Point with fossil fuel sources like natural gas. And we see similar trends in countries like Germany, where a very powerful environmental movement has forced the phasing out of nuclear plants. But the problem is this energy is being replaced by fossil fuel sources and leading to more CO2 emissions, not less. And so in the article, Bhaskar claims that it's very hard to develop wind and solar to capacity without a foundation in nuclear energy. He claims there are just a handful of large economies that have already mostly decarbonized their grids. All of them have a foundation of nuclear or hydroelectricity or both. And then to greater or lesser degrees, add renewables like wind and solar on top. This is because nuclear and hydro are able to provide the electricity whenever we need it. There's also encouraging evidence that he talks a little bit about in the article as well, that advanced modern reactors have technology that make you know, huge catastrophes like Chernobyl very unlikely. But also, you know, safety of nuclear reactors is partly a labor issue. And I had an interesting conversation um, with the head of the Sheet Metal Workers Union in Philly about various things related to just transition. And when it came to nuclear, one thing he pointed out is that, you know, uh, they're letting the infrastructure of nuclear plants deteriorate, and that increases the likelihood of a disaster. But if they're maintained well, um, you can avoid that. And part of maintaining them well is also hiring more workers to do that work. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be aggressively developing wind, solar, and geothermal energy. We, sh we absolutely should. But the reality is we're dealing more and more with limiting the worst scenarios of climate change right now, not stopping it entirely. It's too late for that. So we're moving into a period where we may not get our ideal solution to this crisis. We need to at least consider these options and think about plans that are concrete, that are realistic, and can get labor support. Because as we talk about a lot, we'll need labor's coalition in order to prevail. And, you know, on this point, there a few weeks ago, or maybe about a month ago, there was a lot of um, excitement around the United Mine Workers in Virginia actually came out and supported a 
kind of just transition plan. Um, inside that plan, however, was support for carbon capture or storage, which is another very controversial issue within the environmental movement. And I bring that up just to say that, you know, we are increasingly have to look at what is a realistic option that's going to work quickly, or at least be able to make the case to unions like the mine workers of why that might not might uh, not be the best option. But what is the viable option that we are presenting? Um, so, Kay, I don't know what you think about all this. Again, I'm, I want to be clear. I'm not saying like, let's just go nuclear. Let's just, you know, go go all the way with that. But, you know, I think Bhaskar's article was good because it really made me rethink some of my assumptions. And like, you know, I just think we need to uh, hear out these ideas a little bit more. Yeah, no, totally. And I, I think, I mean, I, I think how you framed it right now was pretty fair. I'd like to think that Bhaskar framed it pretty fair, although uh, obviously Bhaskar is our employer. So um, take that for what it is. But <laughs> I mean, I think I think there's three things that really socialists have to keep in mind when they're thinking about this. Um, they have to, of course, you have to hold on to certain principles of just like uh, what, you know, how, how, are, how does our worldview make sense? What kinds of um, policies fit uh, a just, more egalitarian, more sustainable future that is to the benefit of working people? So principles one, uh, two, you know, our constituency on the left are workers and uh, especially organized labor. So how does organized labor approach this question? And that's not to say that the left and labor have to be, you know, one for one on everything. It's obviously it's it's going there's going to be differences and there's going to be disagreements. But um, the left has to, uh, I think, put greater priority into how labor is approaching these questions. And uh, and at the very least, devise strategies around how do we actually speak with where workers actually are right now. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, I think it's, you know, we just um, we should be mercenary about the actual technology like that. Uh, you know, Obviously, we need more wind and solar and tidal and hydro where we can expand that. Um, but uh, nuclear is uh, way safer than it, it you know, it's probably it's probably been safer than we've ever actually understood, but it's certainly much safer now because of the new technology. Uh, and so the, the the choices in front of us, if we are to survive climate change, I mean, the first choice is that we just don't, <laughs> which would be bad. And we should try <laughs> our best not to do that. Um, although it's not really us doing it. It's like it's us not being able to effectively mount a fight against the capitalists who are driving right. us over the cliff right now. But short of that, um, our options are, uh, it's either going to be some combination of uh, nuclear and hydro and wind and solar or coal and wind and solar for the reasons that you and Boscar have stated that you necessarily need some kind of energy, energy source that is stable, that um, isn't variable, meaning uh, you always have a consistent amount of, uh, of input from the energy source, whereas just kind of very obvious points. Like it, it's almost, it's seemingly too obvious that with uh, with wind, it's, you know, you have different patterns of wind. You have some days are really windy, some days are not as windy. With sun uh, or solar rather, you don't always have the sun directly shining on it. So, um, and at different intensities. So the point is that this is a variable energy source and a highly useful and necessary energy source but we're ne we're going to have to rely on one of these more stable energy sources that we can always guarantee a certain amount of power generation from just because we live in a modern economy and that's not going to change regardless of what the trajectory is so right. it really the option really is are we going to do wind solar and oil and and uh and coal or natural gas or are we going to do wind solar and nuclear mm -hmm. and I just right. don't see how there's any other choices. Right. And, yeah. You know, and, and it's like, and and there's also, I mean, there's possibly a middle road here where it's like, you know, we can also talk about, well, maybe we're at least not shutting down current nuclear power plants when like we could be maintaining them, at least keeping them in existence and, um, like that. But um, so speaking of technology, I know you have uh, some thoughts on on this about how technology will inevitably save us all, right? That's what uh, you're about to talk about. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that's um, that's kind of what Mark said. So I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna listen and to- And I what, follow what, what I don't know about you, but I, yeah. know, whatever he says is cool with me, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I am a dogmatic socialist, dogmatic Marxist, um, mm -hmm. but no, actually, uh, 
I well here let's jump into it this is a little awkward because I'm producing this so sorry guys but here we go <laughs> all right so uh, depending on who you ask socialists are guilty of many sins we're accused of, of only focusing on the economy of reducing everything to class of believing in bloodthirsty revolution and simultaneously being enveloped in utopian fantasies all of these would be pretty bad if any of them were true uh, and each of them deserves a serious response from the socialist left. But for tonight, I want to focus on a different one of the major sins, uh, sinful ac accusations levied at socialists, namely that socialists are technological determinists. And that's kind of a jargony mouthful, I know. Uh, basically, it just means that socialists are accused of seeing all of human history as a predetermined, predestined series of events that come about because we have more and more technology. Greater technology means greater historical development. This is sinful because it's seen as cold and heartless, saying people have no real free will or individual agency. We're all just cogs in a machine. Now, I'm a socialist, and I think that sounds pretty bad. I also think it's wrong. And so I want to try to explain what a real socialist theory of history is and why it matters. So first, according to the critics, where does this notion of technological determinism come from? Well, as I said a moment ago, it comes from good old Karl Marx. He is typically the source of these accusations. So what did Marx actually say? Well, he both said a lot of things and not enough things. Marx is credited as the originator of the socialist theory of history, but he also never really wrote out his theory at length. We have a few scattered references across Marx's early writing, but many of these quotes seem incompatible. So for instance, in The Poverty of Philosophy, he says that the handmill gives you society with, uh, with the feudal lord, the steam mill gives you society with the industrial capitalist. Okay, that's fairly technologically deterministic. But then in the Communist Manifesto, he writes, the history of all previously existing society is the history of class struggle. Okay, so which is it? Does the steam mill give us capitalism or does class struggle? The steam mill is not sentient. It does not have individual agency. People do. So it seems more accurate to agree with the second statement. But is all history really class struggle? Well, as Terry Eagleton writes, we can't, of course, he can't, of course, mean that literally. If brushing my teeth last Wednesday counts as part of history, then it is hard to see that this is a matter of class struggle. Perhaps history refers to public events, not private ones like brushing one's teeth. But that brawl in the bar last night was public enough. So perhaps history is confined to major public events. But by whose definition? It might count as an instance of class struggle if Che Guevara had been run over by a truck, but only if a CIA agent was at the wheel. Otherwise, it would have just been an accident. The story of women's oppression interlocks with the history of class struggle, but it is not just an aspect of it. The, uh, the same goes for the poetry of Wordsworth and Seamus Henney. Class struggle can't cover everything. So what does class, co what does class struggle cover? Well, to have class struggle, you have to have classes. And to know what class struggle is, you have to know what a class is. So what makes up a class? Well, obviously a class is really just a big group of people, but what kind of people? Are people who drive trucks a class or people who eat at McDonald's, people who buy Gucci? If someone is really courteous or wears a nice suit, are they classy? Uh, I mean, I think all of these sorts of things actually obscure what class is. And the reason is, is that class can't truly be defined on its own. A class only exists in relation to another class. So to call someone a worker or a member of the working class means that they work for someone else in a different class. So class is defined by a, relation, a relationship to another class on the basis of property, who owns what. And in the words of the late great Eric Olin Wright, class expresses that what you have determines what you have to do to make a living in our society. So if you own a factory or a business that generates profit and you hire workers in your own workplace, you are a capitalist. And if you don't own that stuff and you have to find a job to get the money you need to get by, you're a worker. It can be broken down further than that, of course, but that's that's the gist. So these sorts of relationships, capitalist and worker, worker and landlord, worker and worker, capitalist and capitalist, these sorts of relationships are what Marx calls the relations of production. Think of relationships. When I say relations, that's what I'm referring to. This is what class struggle is focused on. These are distinguished from something else Marx calls the forces of production. And I'm going to explain that in a second. 
Now, if you ask most people how history proceeds, they'd say that history has progressed. They might mean that in terms of social progress, like the fact that most people today have more humane and kind feelings toward others than they did say when we had slavery or when women couldn't vote or own property or when gay people weren't allowed to marry. But they might also mean progress in terms of productivity. It seems that society just keeps on getting more advanced year after year. But what is advancing? Well, Marx would say that the forces of production are advancing or improving. And the forces are just those things that are used by producers to produce products in the production process. Say that three times fast. It's just the things that make production and productivity possible. More concretely, the forces of production include our ability to labor or expend effort, uh, what Marx calls the, uh, our labor power, and the means of production. And the means of production include tools, machines, land and space, and raw materials. So whenever I say forces, just think of like the ability to labor and technology. Marx says these things advance because over time they're, repl they're replaced by superior forces or are used more productively. Okay, so hopefully you're all still with me. Relations of production, forces of production. How the fuck does this explain history? <laughs> well, Marx wrote out his most articulate uh, explanation in the preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy of 1859. And instead of reading out what he wrote, I think it'd be better to show you G.A. Cohen doing what I think is a fairly accurate reenactment of the moment that Marx wrote this document. He was just about to sit down at his desk and write when, Carl, this is Jenny calling. I'm ready. I'm waiting. It's your wife. I'll be there in a few minutes. In the social production of their life. Man, where's my man? I want you, Carl. I'm waiting. I'll be there soon, Jenny. Men enter into... Carl, I want you. I'm ready. You said you'd have re you'd have relations with... Yes, relations. Men enter into relations that are... Carl, you need it. You know you can't do without... Yes, that are indispensable. And Carl, it's not a matter of choice for you. One look at me and you'll fall into my arms. And independent of their will. <clears throat> Carl, hurry. Jenny, I'll be with you in a moment. I'm inspired. I've got it on the tip of my how to say you know what. <laughs> the sum total of these relations from the economic structure of society, the real, uh, the real, uh, Carl, the mattress is terrific today. It's really strong. The real foundation upon which, Carl, are you getting bigger? Are you getting bigger for me, Carl? Upon which rises, yes. A, uh, Carl, there's nothing wrong with it, you know. It's not against the law. You should come now. Upon which rises. It's not against the law, Carl. A legal and political. Mm, upon which rises. A legal. Carl, will you bring your superstructure up to me right now? Please, I'm dying for it. A superstructure. <sighs> and to which correspond... Carl, I can't help it anymore. I'm full of these fantasies in my brain. There's so much I can't stop thinking about. Please, Carl, these ideas, they're wonderful. Definite forms of social consciousness. Uh, Carl, uh, I'm coming, I'm coming. Is that all right? RIP to a legend. Uh, so to reiterate what's just been said, Marx argued that the forces of production, meaning our ability to labor and the means of production, tools, machinery, land, and their specific level of productivity determine which relations of production, worker to capitalist, peasant to lord, exist in a given moment in history. But then these relations place limits on the forces to develop. And the result is that the relations will come into conflict with the forces and create new relations that best meet the requirements of the forces to continue to advance. So hunter-gatherer society, societies with just a little bit of productivity were replaced by feudal lords and peasants with just a little bit more productivity. 
And then feudal lords and peasants were replaced by capitalists and workers because of the way production was carried out to increase productivity needed or carried out to increase productivity needed a new set of social property relations. This actually isn't all that different than many conservative arguments. Conservatives say history is kind of a continuous blossoming of ever greater productive power and living standards, all leading up to the present moment. The big difference is that they say that modern day capitalism was something that naturally evolved and grew up, and grew up from the younger, less robust version of itself in the past through moments of eureka. Uh, they also are saying all this to try to justify uh, capitalism on moral grounds and as an inevitable part of human nature, but that's besides the point. Marx and socialists broadly say that history has distinct historical epochs. Feudalism and capitalism are different periods of human history because they're defined by different social rules for everyone involved. So in feudalism, a peasant has partial ownership of the land that he works and has to offer the Lord a cut of what he produces. A worker doesn't own the land or other productive assets and has to sell her ability to work to a boss in exchange for a wage. So the classic theory of history, according to Marx, explains how humans have moved from one epoch to another, and the theory has roughly four major epochs that translate to something like this. Uh, and so I'm using a little bit of different terminology, but a pre-class society is what I'm calling like hunter-gatherer, where they have really no surplus. And the surplus is basically just those resources that are left over after uh, enough has been expended to make sure everyone you know, in society doesn't die. Although, you know, that everyone is a, a shifting category, let's say, but more or less, they don't have much left over. It's, it's basically subsistence. Um, but in pre-capitalist class society, which we're, I'm thinking of feudalism, there's some surplus. And this is mostly consumed by uh, the lords and by kings, and it mostly goes to paying for castles and armies and that sort of thing. But in capitalist society, we have a much higher surplus. Uh, and in this society, obviously, capitalists, for the most part, because they hoard uh, all of the means of production, end up uh, having the first say at what to do with the surplus. And most of it is also hoarded or uh, put back into, um, it's reinvested so that they can end up just making more profit. But in a post-class society, a post-capitalist society, there's going to be a massive surplus where everybody's needs are met. And uh, it's, it, this is what we're thinking of when we say socialism or communism, or this is what Marx is saying effectively. Everyone's needs are met and there's more than enough to go around. So class struggle gets you from one epoch to the next. But Marx also says that this order I just described is hardwired in. So we necessarily are going from hunter gatherer to feudalism and from feudalism to capitalism and from capitalism to socialism and communism. We know the first two steps. That actually happened and we have historical scholarship on them. How do we know that the next step is the socialism and or communism? So I've already explained two thirds of the puzzle. First, according to Marx, society tends to develop over time because the forces tend to advance. And second, the forces will compel the relations to change to new forces that allow for greater productivity. The third, third reason, uh, the new forces that come to, to be only do so because they're optimal. Or in the words of G.A. Cohen, who we just saw a moment ago, when relations endure stably, they do so because they promote the development of the forces. When re uh, relations are revolutionized, the old relations cease to exist because they no longer favor the forces and the new relations come into being because they are apt to do so. Dysfunctional relations persist for a time before being replaced. During that time, the character of the relations is explained by their uh, suitability to a past stage in the development of the forces. Thus, if the relations suit the development of the forces, they obtain because they suit the development of the forces. And if the relations do not suit the development of the forces, they obtain because they recently did so. So the relation of worker to capitalist exists because it enabled greater productivity than the relation of peasant to lord. That's the theory of history according to Marx. The ever advancing forces shape the relations which in turn fetter the forces and the forces really select new, more optimal relations to encourage the forces to advance ever more. Really simple, right? Okay, obviously this is fairly complex and you know, so is life, but the problem is the formulation is also wrong. This is typically the argument that gets called technologically deterministic. And while I could quibble about the accuracy of calling it that, I'd rather present what has been understood as a more plausible socialist theory of history. So 
couple things. The first is that there is no reason to believe that capitalism necessarily leads to socialism, and certainly not because socialism is optimal for advancing productivity. The future is not determined, and when we look at previous transitions, say from feudalism to capitalism, it kind of happened on accident. Feudal lords pursuing their immediate class interests in the aftermath of a crisis accidentally changed the rules of the game. Oops. But nothing said they had to create capitalism. The other thing is that productivity increases occurring everywhere all the time is kind of exclusive to capitalism. So if you look at the history of economic growth, most of human history was actually fairly stagnant. Now, obviously, this isn't a graph of all of human history, um, but you kind of get the, the gist of, the, of what I'm talking about from this. This is the GDP per capita in England which as, as you all should know, England is where capitalism starts. But for most of most of this time, it's basically just flatlining. And then beginning in uh, the 17th century, you're seeing you know some little, starting to trickle a little bit, starting to move a little bit, wiggle. Um, it's wiggling some more, it's going up and up. And then uh, by the 19th century, you're really starting to see that curve. And the 20th century, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's just a whole, you're in, you're in space, you're on the moon now. So we have, in fact, had long periods of time with little to no productive growth. Finally, it's not quite the case that the productive forces, which again, forces are the level of uh, technological and labor productivity, compel new productive relations into existence. As Vivek Chimmer, uh, Chipper summarizes the change in this theory, he writes, while the productive forces barely retain their capacity towards an upward ascent, the realization of this capacity is now contingent upon its interaction with other mechanisms in society. And the net outcome need not necessarily be in favor of growth. What the productive forces are doing now is not selecting for a particular set of production relations, but rather selecting against those which would induce a regression in the level of productive forces. The selectional role of the productive forces switched from selecting for a particular set of production relations to selecting against a class of production relations. So in other words, the fact that you have labor and technological productivity increases doesn't mean that the new forces will, uh, or that the new relations will just arise. People pursue their material interests within social structures that have both incentives and punishments built in, and the social relations that gov govern our lives can remain in place even if technology and the forces of production keep getting more productive and advanced. The only thing that the forces select against are less productive relations of production. And that's because of the power of the class structure and the rules for classes to reproduce themselves over time. There are people within uh, at a given epoch, an economic epoch, that are going to try to maintain that system because it's in their class interest to, uh, to further their uh, material interest, interest within that system. So in capitalism, capitalists increase productivity constantly, seemingly exponentially, as that graph I put up shows. And that's because in the war for profits, the way capitalists compete is by out-innovating their competitors. But this same process also destroys the physical and mental lives of the vast majority of us. For capitalists, we truly are just cogs in the machine. They really will grind us into dust if it means they can get more profit. So does all of this mean, after everything that I've just said, does all this mean that a real theory of history is just class struggle, as Marx said in the manifesto? <laughs> God, I, I wish it were that simple. Um, okay, not quite, but yeah, mostly. Mostly that's right. Um, but the actual process of capitalists acquiring more profit means that there are limitations placed on that class struggle. And the more mature Marx also knew this. Uh, as he wrote in Capital Volume 1, uh, the rise of wages is confined within limits that not only leave intact the foundations of the capitalist system, but also secure its reproduction on an increasing scale. The structure of capital accumulation both increases the productivity of the forces of production and places limitations on workers' capacity to fight back. Not their ability, but their capacity to actualize their ability. And that's because workers are dependent on their boss for their survival. Because they don't own the means of production, workers are forced to work for a boss in exchange for a wage. This basic power asymmetry is precisely why workers ultimately need institutions, unions, and political parties that multiply their class power. It is through their enhancement 
of capacity and power that they can then, in fact, fight back and ultimately make history of their own choosing. Socialism may not be inevitable, but it's most certainly possible and winnable. Paul, <laughs> uh, are you a technological I, I, determinist or, or what? Well, first, let me say, I didn't know that video was coming, and that, <laughs> that was great. That really uh, that really threw me off. But um, Cohen's one of the best. He's, <laughs> he's, he is, basically, he reproduces Marx's, like, somewhat more deterministic argument of historical materialism, of his theory of history, mm -hmm. um, and does it in such a way that is just, like, unbelievably brilliant, um, in that, like, we actually, like, actually have a theory of history for Marx based on his work, despite the fact that Marx had so, you know, kind of fragmented things to say about it. Right. Um, and it just, I think Cohen had like totally revolutionized like how we actually like should analyze uh, the world and talk um, in, in Marxist terms. So, and, you know, and big now I know, I know now the reason it was so fragmented was Jenny Marx. Yeah. He just couldn't, couldn't focus. Um, but, but no, I think, you know, I think a good example of kind of what you're talking about is um, automation and um, the length of the workday. You know, like we really technology is at a point where it could liberate us from a lot of work. Like we could be shortening the workday and spreading the work around like very easily. But, you know, it's not going to be inevitable. That is a mm -hmm. political fight that has to be waged, you know, by workers um, and, and has been over time. I mean, there's a reason, you know, before unions, it was very normal to just be working 60, 70 hours a week. The 40 hour workday didn't just like fall from the sky. They had to fight for that. Um, so, you know, we, we, we all know so much potential exists with technology and especially now the exponential rate that it's uh, improving, but none of that is inevitable. You know, that's a political fight. So I think that's a kind of a good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly right, I think. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, that is the importance of class struggle. Like that is like workers fighting for their interests against the opposing interests of of bosses broadly. Um, so, right. and this is part of the problem of like socialists historically. I mean, the other thing is like this project that we're a part of has only existed for like 150 years. So like there's been plenty of errors, there's been plenty of trial and error. A lot of socialists have just kind of take it, taken it as an inevitability that, um, you know, as capitalism proceeds and gets bigger and badder, um, more productive capitalists having more control over more resources, uh, that this necessarily will mean uh, the system will uh, fall apart and socialism, socialism might not be, um, uh, they still believe that you had to, you know, these are the people who believe this were in socialist parties, they had massive labor movements, like they still believe like there was a good deal of importance for like them actually pursuing these politics, um, but that it wasn't, uh, if it was just when, when are we, when do we uh, bring about the revolution? And um, because the system cannot uh, maintain uh, this, this arrangement for much longer. Right. And, you know, I, I can maybe understand that if I lived in 1917, but anyone living now who thinks that's inevitable, um, I don't know what world you're living in. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's, let's bring on our guest. I think he has a lot of things to say about this. So our guest tonight is Lee Phillips. He is the science writer at Jackman. You might not have known that we have a science writer, but this is Lee oh, Phillips. Yeah. He's author of books like Austerity Ecology and The People's Republic of Walmart. So welcome, Lee. Very glad to have you. Hi there. Uh, good to be here. I, uh, to yeah, I, I love that um, G.A. Cohen. Uh, clip I had never come across it before. Really? My God, if the man were still alive today, he would uh, like he'd totally be a great YouTuber. That was awesome. Or actually, from that clip, uh, probably more like OnlyFans or something. It's a little bit risky. <laughs> um, yeah, no, good to be here. Um, so, Lee, part of what we wanted to bring you on to the big, the big Jacobin Science uh, Palooza episode uh, is that you wrote a really good piece uh, last month, actually. Um, that everyone should go read because again, really good, uh, called, um, actually no, two months ago. Damn, it's been, time flies. Um, we don't need Elon Musk to explore the solar system. Um, you know, obviously that article, just like this video, uh, references Elon Musk because, uh, you know, it's important to talk about Elon, but the, the article goes so much deeper than that and people should really, um, dive into it. And hopefully we can get to some of that in a moment, but, um, I just want to start off. Uh, 
So you say we don't need Elon Musk to explore the solar system. Why is that, Lee? Yeah, so I I, I, I don't say that. Um, uh, uh, that wasn't my title. Uh, it's weird people don't realize this, but uh, mm. journalists often don't write their own titles. Somebody else does, a copy editor does. And um, mm. actually, I, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have put it that way. Um, my original title was uh, Elon Musk is not wrong about making humans a multi-planetary society. Um, uh, but no, you know, to, fair enough to the copy editors, that's kind of a clunky uh, clunky title. Um, so maybe that was uh, the the one that was chosen. It's more sort of clickbaity. Um, probably got more hits than my boring title would have uh, ever got, but. The point was um, that I wanted to sort of push back against, uh, or let me put it another way. I think that there's a lot of ways that progressives, certainly socialists, can make a really great critique of, of, uh, of Elon Musk and um, his projects for uh, Mars colonization. Um, uh, you know, he's a, you know, he, Union busting within within Tesla and the the, the appalling uh, working conditions there. Um, the fact that he's a he's a centibillionaire. Uh, just you know, with socialists, we would say there shouldn't be centibillionaires. Um, I, and I wanted to develop more coherent uh, critiques. But one of the things that I was really worried about was that uh, there was a sort of um, well, there was a, a tweet that he had uh, put out um, in March where. I th it was Bernie Sanders who had initially said, some, uh, tweeted mm -hmm. something, or I guess his staff or whatever tweeted something about how, you know, uh, between Musk and and Bezos, uh, they have more wealth than the bottom forty percent of Americans, and you know that's a great, uh, great you know, line, score, great cr uh, critique. Um, and then um, Elon Musk responds to this by saying he, he has his own tweet saying. You know, I am accumulating resources to make life uh, multiplanetary um, and extend the light of consciousness to the stars. <clears throat> and and then there were all this this sort of uh, you know snark and uh, particularly from some people on the left who were like, oh, you know, this is childish, this is colonial. Um, um, we have more important things to worry about right now here on Earth. Um, this is this is ridiculous. Uh, Earth w is the only home we'll ever have, and um, I really wanted to take apart those sort of ideas. Um, at one point, even uh, sort of Bernie Sanders responds to um, to that very quote by Elon Musk, and he said, and Bernie says, or again his staff uh, says, uh, says, space travel is an exciting idea, uh, but now we need to focus on Earth. And you know, Ben talks about the need for healthcare and, and combating inequality. And all these are that's that's a great point. But <clears throat> I was really worried that this is a sort of um, false dichotomy that we can have we can have space exploration, we can have space travel, we can even in the you know distant future a space colonization, and we can solve uh, you know poverty and inequality. We can have healthcare for all, and we can have both. Um, mm -hmm. There's a sort of uh, I mean, just straight out of the gate. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Pentagon has a budget, of uh, like this year, I, I looked it up before I came on this year's, um, Pentagon budget, official budget is seven, uh, 753 billion dollars and NASA's budget is just 23 billion. So, you know, we could have a lot fewer wars and a lot more space very easily, even without, um, never mind socialism, just even just a little bit neoliberalism, a little bit less um, uh, militarism, we could have a lot more space. So it's, um, uh, I felt that this was a sort of, you're, Bernie, I love the guy, but in this case, he was wrong. Uh, he was sort of leaning into a sort of neoliberal uh, position that there's the p size of the pie is only so big and we have to choose either healthcare or space. I would choose like, yeah, um, less Pentagon, more, more space. That was the sort of thing that I wanted to get across. So one cheer for Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's it's pushing back against kind of a, a more uh, austere way of thinking about politics. Exactly. Yeah. But wouldn't just to, to push a little bit back and then we'll kind of move on. But because um, we as a socialist, we still need to have priorities. We still need to say yeah, this is sure. priority number one. Um, but uh, you're saying that we also shouldn't, you know, just because something isn't, let's say, 
um, I'll, I'll just say, like, for my part, I think healthcare is number one. Um, yeah. But, you know, but we shouldn't then say that we, you know, there isn't a, still a list, like we still have other priorities. And the fact, and it might be the case that by draining the budget, um, you know, of the Pentagon, uh, you know, part of that might go into healthcare, but, you know, that it should also go into NASA, that, it, you know, it could be multifaceted. Oh, I mean, just in the fair, uh, you know accounting level, it's fairly straightforward already to to be doing this. If we, uh, but but in the there's a more philosophical question around priorities. Absolutely, um, uh, even under a, a you know fully socialist society, we will still have priorities because there's still only so many resources that we could could uh, could could use, and certain certain things will be more um, more important than other things. But if we take it like a purely utilitarian approach where we're just constantly maximizing um, utility, um, we run into all sorts of trouble straight away. You, we can go back to the, the, the old slogan from the, the, the turn of the last century from socialists and trade unionists who demanded you know, uh, um, not just bread, but roses too. Um, um, if we, if we only focus on the sort of maximally uh, useful uh, um, items, then all of those other little things, um, well, maybe even so little things like music and art and mm -hmm. and and great food and craft beers and space, um, these are certainly nowhere near the, the 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 top of the list compared to. Um, uh, healthcare, let's say, but we still need those as well. We need a bit of, of, of color in our life as well. Mm -hmm. While we it seems like the, it seems like the science is more of the bread than the roses, actually, though. Well, the, I mean, this is the other thing is that if we take a again a strictly utilitarian uh, focus here, um, this would basically say that um, we are only doing applied research now, only research that has a clear. Um, uh, near-term or medium-term benefit to humanity that we can project, predict. Um, and so blue sky curiosity-driven research, what in the scientific community is called basic research, uh, we would say we weren't, aren't going to do any of that. Mm -hmm. But you immediately run into a problem there um, with applied research because applied research, by you know, the name is you're applying basic research. So you have to start somewhere in that, like, just like sense of wonder, curiosity. I have no idea what possible utility this is, but I just find it so cool that I want to discover more about it. Um, um, whether or not that will have any application. Now, the reality is that um, uh, almost everything that you do um, research uh, in, in terms of sort of blue sky basic curiosity driven research does inevitably um, have some sort of um, application. But if, but yeah, I mean, this, this is the same logic to say we should not do any space exploration, um, we should not do space travel, we should focus on healthcare alone. Uh, you know, the logic behind that would also say we shouldn't have a large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. um, it also says that we shouldn't be, you know, teaching uh, French literature at university, that we should only be studying math and economics and, and the hard sciences and medicine and engineering. I mean, this this is not a left wing argument at all. This is this is the argument that we hear on the right on a regular basis from conservatives who you know, mm. like, why are we teaching you know, <laughs> cinema studies at public <laughs> universities? Um, you know, it's. I love I love that. That's the standard conservative impression. Um, <laughs> they all sound like. They do. Um, That's good. So you also mentioned in your article how you were, you know, at first skeptical about, you know, uh, building up uh, space programs in developing countries yeah. and how you, your mindset actually changed as you kind of looked into it. Can you talk about what, what changed your mind on that? Yeah. Wow. That's, you know, um, so um, uh, a few years ago, I was I was working for, for Nature, the science journal in the, in the UK. And a lot of my focus at the time was on um, science in the developing world. And one of the stories that I, the sort of features that I pitched um, uh, initially when I was um, going for the, the position um, that got me the position, I guess, and that they wanted me to explore was um, I'd, I'd heard a lot about um, space programs in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, South, some South American countries. And I thought that I would have this nice sort of, if I dug deep into it, do a bit more research, 
um, I would find how this was, uh, you know, a nice little story about um, corrupt governments, neoliberal governments wasting public spending, you know, in places where there aren't, you know, uh, proper roads, where they don't have working uh, sewage systems. And these would just be like vanity projects for some, um, yeah, neoliberal um, semi dictator or whatever. And, um, or never mind, I mean, just, I thought it would be this lovely story of bad priorities, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so the, you know, my editors let me uh, go off and do some research into this. And I, I called up a bunch of um, engineers uh, from the UK and the US who were advising a lot of these programs. And I said, you know, do you want to speak off the record? So I could really get a sense of what was going on. And, and uh, they, they said, you know, you're not wrong. There is, you know, there is there's there's a lot of corruption there's malfunctions there's uh, delays it's that's that's true that is part of part of the story but it's not the whole story there is also um genuine um technology transfer there is real transfer of skills and knowledge um it's you know basically it's a bit of a mixed bag and then all of them every single one of them said uh something along the lines of um however when i got in country and local people asked me what I was what what I was here for, and I told them I was helping, you know, um, build the the space the national space program. Um, uh, everybody would burst with pride. They were hmm. so uh, just uh, yeah proud that they also that their country also could be pioneers and explorers. That uh, they were just as good as uh as you know the united states or the former ussr or some of the other countries have since got into the space race and um and i realized yeah i mean that's bread and roses right there that the very people who are confronting um uh you know poor water systems or whatever at the same time they're able to in their heads have a sense of like we want roses too and uh so i i put my story away <laughs> And I never wrote it. And I wrote about um, um, the collapse of mathematical um, uh, training and knowledge in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, after the end of the Cold War and how, um, and the work of um, uh, Neil Turok, a, a South African um, physicist, uh, as you know, to build a new mathematical um, Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town. Um, I, interestingly, he's the son of Ben Chirac, who was the uh, the sort of the ar architect, the author of uh, the African National Congress's um, uh, armed struggle strategy during the uh, fight against apartheid. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so that's so that's what I wrote about instead. And actually, that's perfect. You predicted my next question. Could you go into more like why was it that after the Cold War in these countries there was a decline in mathematical training? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's a great, great question. I wish more people, even within the scientific community, were uh, were aware of this this issue. Um, mathematics is the sort of the foundation of everything. Um, it's um, you can't never mind do any science if there isn't um, you know high quality mathematical training. You're not going to be able to do like where do you get your 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 experts within your your finance department um, building enterprises. Um, engineering, building roads, infrastructure, all, of, all that stuff depends on a foundation, a, fa a mathematical foundation. And during the Cold War, um, as a result of yeah, the, uh, the rivalry between the United States and, and, and the USSR, both, both countries and France as well, um, spent um, a great deal of money um, on mathemat ma mathematical training in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and but at the end, of, after the end of the Cold War, they just sort of basically stopped being interested in this. The whole point during the Cold War was to try to win one country or another country, or part or factions within those countries to one side or the other side in the Cold War. Um, at the end of the Cold War, uh, that that ended, and that was fine for a while. But um, but those people these days are now, you know, they're getting very old. Um, they're retiring or dying. And there hasn't really been much of a replacement, and so 
um, the African um, Institute of, of Mathematical Sciences or AIMS uh, was created uh, to try to um, combat that. And they have, it's an amazing place. Um, there are um, not just uh, mathematicians, but cosmologists, mathematical physicists who uh, basically volunteered their time for months at a time. Um, and uh, it's completely free. Um, uh, people from right across uh, Africa can go so long as they're they're clever enough. Um, it's uh, it's 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 an amazing project. I mean, I think it's 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 socialism before before our time. Hmm. Before it's time. <laughs> well, so it seems like so much of uh, space exploration and and technology that goes into that process is being carried out in private hands. I guess yeah. even before I ask, like. A bigger question, just how much of that is in fact carried out by SpaceX and other companies uh, as compared to NASA? Well, you... one of the, I mean, one of the things that is a little bit, um, uh, a lot of people on both sides of the debate sort of um, uh, get wrong here is that um, even though prior to the, this sort of new era of commercial space uh, space flight, um, you know, the the, 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 the the zenith of, of, of the space race, NASA was still using other companies to produce the widgets, the various different um, uh, parts of, of rockets and so on. Um, that really hasn't changed. I mean, it is not the case that SpaceX is, is going to space. NASA um, uses uh, SpaceX um, in the same way that, you know, historically it has been using well, until, you know, until recently, the United Space Alliance, which is um, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. And the reason that they switched to uh, to SpaceX for a number of projects, uh, and, you know, SpaceX is really kicking the United Space Alliance's ass, is because uh, the United Space Alliance, um, you know, they charge, uh, I think it is $460 million per launch. And uh, SpaceX is, as of so a few months ago, the numbers might have changed since then uh, when I was writing about this, but it was $62 million per launch. So a radical reduction. Um, and um, the the primary way that they've been able to achieve this is that um, Boeing and uh, Lockheed Martin are a classic example of uh, bloat in the private sector where um, you know, 1,200 1, of their components are outsourced to other companies. Mm -hmm. And each of these companies will add their own uh, profit margin. And that's why you end up with a, this grotesque figure of, of almost half a billion dollars per launch. Um, uh, Elon Musk, and I actually have to say, this is, this is a piece of genius, really. He, is, he went against all sorts of um, really right-wing um, conventional wisdom within the business community since the 1980s. Uh, that said, you know, companies need to focus on on one thing and one thing alone, and they outsource everything else. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's a sort of it's an echo of the the socialist calculation debate that uh, Michal Rosworski and I talk about within uh, the People's Republic of Walmart. And about we'll your copy. There. Paul, get your copy. Uh. <laughs> the, the, the economic calculation debate or the conservative um, argument within the economic calculation debate actually had an impact on the private sector as well, and they thought that. Um, any sort of vertical integration um, was is 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 a bad idea. Um, mm -hmm. You're basically because the the conservative argument would be there are simply too many variables um, in this this vast um, supply chain. Um, uh, leave it up to markets instead. Uh, they're much more uh, efficient at allocation than trying to have that in house. And Elon Musk said, like, no, this is, this is nonsense. Um, and 70% of the components of his, uh, of his rockets and other uh, sort of products as, as SpaceX produces are made in house. And he's done a similar thing with Tesla where um, he has reached so far back into the supply chain uh, that, uh, that Tesla is now actually even uh, investing in lithium mines directly rather than like contracting with lithium comp mining companies. Um, and the reason for this is because it's, uh, well, one, you, you're you cutting out all of the, that, that, that salami slicing of, of profit margins, so you can produce a much cheaper product. But also, crucially, with respect to innovation, um, uh, all you have to do is you have somebody in, in like, you know, a few 
desks down say to uh, the other person, well, we need this widget. Can you can you make this widget? I say, okay, yeah, for sure. And the all the transaction costs that would normally be in place if that other um, uh, worker or engineer or whoever was in some other company are gone. So it, it streamlines innovation. It creates much more innovation. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, so as I say, one chair for, for Elon Musk um, <laughs> there. One chair. I mean, but that's like, it's, it's funny because like when your piece came out uh, now much later than I realized, um, there was a little bit of like a, a kerfuffle online about it because it was like, oh, Lee is uh, endorsing uh, space colonization. Um, Elon Musk wants space colonization. Lee wants space colonization. Um, Lee and Musk want the same thing, presumably. Yeah. Um, I Lee, guess Lee is basically Columbus. Basically. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. No, there were like, um, my God, there were uh, people saying uh, Lee, Phillips, Jacobin, you know, they're, um, they're genocidal, they're endorsing uh, col colonialism. And for fuck's sake, um, rocks are not people. Right. <laughs> rocks are literally not people. Like this is actually the uh, the sort of genocidal mentality of uh, the colonialists uh, of the new world, that they didn't conceive of um, indigenous people as equal to other human beings. They considered them less mm -hmm. like rocks or, or other animals or plants. Um, so the bizarre thing is that these people are, are you know, suggesting that Mars uh, which may be, as far as we know, um, uh, bereft of all life. It's a rock. Um, if it isn't, there, there's some microbes there, but uh, there would be microbes there. I mean, I'm hoping that there is. Um, but because you want colonization, right? <laughs> Actually, I, ironically, the um, yeah. the existence would, of, of microbes would uh, could potentially uh, uh, delay it, but uh, mm. that's. Uh, I actually, I'm more in favor of um, colon colonization of Venus than mm. I have of Mars. Mm. Sense. Uh, just, it's because, and this goes back to the Elon Musk stuff. Um, so, and this is where the, 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 the headline is actually quite accurate for the article. So um, we all focus on Elon Musk's tweets about this stuff, but he actually wrote a, an academic or an academic paper in 2017 in the, in the journal New Space, which is this academic journal uh, devoted to um, the commercial space sector. Although judging by the quality of uh, Elon Musk's paper, I don't know what the quality of the actual, you know, academic quality of this, this journal is. But um, anyway, um, mm -hmm. if you read that paper, he, uh, he makes an argument as to why we need to be a multiplanetary species and how we're gonna go about doing this. And um, his argument is basically that at some point their um, life on Earth might be uh, existentially challenged and we need to spread human consciousness to other planets um, so that, um, well, for species preservation, preservation regions, reasons. But the bulk of the, uh, the paper is actually just an explanation of um, SpaceX's business model, the viability of making rockets reusable, which again should radically reduce the cost of getting to space. Um, and he sort of, he, he hints at some of the issues with terraforming Mars, but he is very, it, like, basically it's just one or two paragraphs. And that's where the, re the rubber hits the road because um, it's not just the cost of getting to space, which is the great uh, challenge. That's that's the least of our issues. I mean, it's significant, but Mars is, and in fact, space as a whole is incredibly inhospitable to us. Um, um, humans that have spent months on the International Space Station, um, you know, they come back with terrible. Um, health conditions. Uh, some of them are, you know, incorrigible. They're, they're permanent. Um, and uh, the there are some aspects of this that we can we can we can correct. Um, but ultimately, Elon Musk isn't talking about the the costs of correcting those those things in terms of spaceflight. But he's also crucially not talking about correcting the or the cost of correcting them 
on Mars. What he says is that he wants a an independent city. That is to say, it's not just an outpost; it's self-sustaining on Mars. But for that to happen, um, you basically have to terraform Mars. We 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 there are many many issues uh, that 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 uh, that we face there that I talk about in the in the article. One of which is that recently we discovered that. Um, like pretty much all of the soil is is uh, is penetrated by perchlorates, which are incredibly toxic to uh, to humans. We could potentially um, uh, bioremediate that uh, with with bacteria, but because and we when, whenever there are certain any sort of perchlorate spills in, on Earth already, we use uh, we can bioremediate. So, but that's just like one location. We're now talking about bioremediating an entire planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the cost and difficulty of doing that is so much greater than just, say, decarbonizing um, Earth's economy. I mean, that's an enormous challenge, but that's that's a that's a dawdle uh, compared to by remediating the perchlorates um, on an entire planet. And then, of course, the the real kicker here is that. Uh, that Mars has um, it's 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 very small. People don't realize this. Uh, Mars is it has a much smaller mass. It has therefore it has about thirty eight percent of Earth's gravity. And what we do know for sure is that uh, uh, low gravity, microgravity, is uh, is incredibly dangerous to to humans. Um, as I was saying, um, um, uh, astronauts on the International Space Station. You know, you you eventually go blind. Um, you you begin to lose uh, fine motor function. Um, you uh, you lose executive function. I mean, effectively, over, and some of these things are, are fairly fairly permanent. So, like you know, the uh, if you're spending years in a micro -gra gravity environment, effectively every you know few months, you're going to be getting closer and closer to do, you know the Martian equivalent of Alzheimer's. Hmm. Um, <laughs> that and that can't be solved. Uh, that there isn't a technical solution to that. If you smush, if you took Venus and you smushed it into uh, to Mars to make a new planet, you still wouldn't have the uh, quite have the uh, the uh, the mass and the the gravity of of Earth. Now Venus actually does already have. Uh, that's how small Mars is. Um, Venus does have uh, gravity, which is very and mass, which is pretty close to to Earth's, and so that is almost certainly um, a viable option. The problem with uh, Venus at the moment is, you know, it's this hot acid bath with you know ridiculous uh, atmospheric pressures. But those actually are um, um, soluble issues in the way that the the, the low gravity of of of, um, of Mars never will be. Um, it's a sort of there's different kinds of impossible, right? There's impossible at the moment, and then there's like always impossible. And the, mm -hmm. the Mars low gravity is a sort of always impossible kind of condition. But with Venus, I mean, that's a project that would take generations and generations and generations to terraform it. Uh, I won't go into the details of the technology required to do that. And some of these technologies we haven't really um, uh, anywhere come close to developing yet. It mm -hmm. would be like a cathedral that um, over thousands of years, humans decide that this is what we want to do. Um, and and this is one of the arguments that I make in, in the piece is that um, that's not something that capitalism can do. There's no, if you're talking about this uh, sort of Venusian cathedral, terraforming Venus over thousands of years, over hundreds of generations, um, there's no short-term return on investment for any uh, private sector actor. It has to be a public sector endeavor. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, you're, you're really. I'm sign me up for the rocket. Um, <laughs> my, mind, my mind's a little blown right now, but <laughs> um, I mean, but just to just to kind of put a, a point on this, um, you know, and uh, I think you kind of summed up pretty nicely why uh, you know SpaceX is probably not going to to lead us towards this outcome, despite whatever Musk is is advertising. Um, just like the structural requirements of companies needing to make profits within our our given system, um, uh, you know. But why do we have to leave Earth? Like, why ultimately? Why is it that we have to do this in the first place? Um, and and just one point, just to maybe to usurp one of the points you're about to make, um, like the the bit that you wrote about um, 
James Hansen and and yeah. uh, and climate change. The importance uh, for climate change uh, was fascinating. I, I'd never known that, but yeah, why why do we have to leave the blue the blue marble? So there's two reasons, uh, two applied reasons. This is not even basic research reasons. These two applied reasons. The first, in the very very near term, immediate term, uh, is that space science is earth science. Um, uh, James Han James Hansen, the great sort of um, uh, NASA researcher, very famous for, most famous for his um, climate change work uh, and actually even campaigning for climate change, uh, for clim more aggressive climate change action. Uh, he was famously arrested outside the White House during the Obama administration because he felt that the Obama administration wasn't going far enough in terms of um, aggressive climate action. So, you know, he's a real hero of, of, of climate change. He's probably the, one of the reasons that he's also probably most well known is that his testimony to Congress in 1988 um, uh, was sort of the uh, coming out party for, for global warming as a real issue. There were other scientists who knew bits and pieces of the story before, but this was the first time that really the uh, the the, uh, the public had any sort of awareness of it. So he's, you know, he's, he's a sainted figure. Mm -hmm. The reason that he got into climate change issues in the first place and doing climate change research was that he was fascinated by um, Venus's atmosphere, which had, you know, in the, in the deep past, uh, had a runaway greenhouse effect. And that's that's why it is the way it is. And he sort of clocked like, oh, wait, that has relevance to Earth with respect to combustion of fossil fuels, and as we now know, a number of other processes like steel production, cement production, aspects of agriculture. Um, and so we dove into uh, to, uh, to climate change research. Uh, this is what I mean when I say um, uh, earth science, sorry, space science is earth science. NASA, is, mm -hmm. we think of NASA as a place that is an agency that took us to the moon. It was, but it's much more in terms of uh, what it does on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's probably the premier earth science agency, uh, research uh, agency in the world. Uh, from the Landsat uh, program dating back to the 1970s to the roughly about 40 different um, um, earth science programs that it has at the moment, mostly satellite driven. You know, it is how we get our information about um, um, uh, forest cover loss uh, deforestation, uh, how we get our information about the uh, decline of, 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 of sea ice, of uh, ice cap melt. Um, it's increasingly how we're going to be enabling uh, the monitoring of pledges by countries to decarbonize and whether they're actually doing it and, and monitoring their, uh, their carbon emissions from space, um, uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, so not just carbon emissions. Um, it is it, it just so in the short term, it makes no sense to say we need to focus on the earth instead of space. Focusing on space is focusing on the earth. In a much longer, much, much, much longer uh, term, in about 600 million years, um, as the luminosity of the sun increases, it will increase to such an extent that it will basically destabilize the uh, the carbonate uh, silicate uh, cycle, which is a very, very long um, cycle on Earth where I won't go into too many details of it unless you want me to. Uh, but basically what this means is that- I mean, I want you to, but you you should probably not. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I love my geology, so- All right, let's I, do I, it. I could, but um, the, the, the short version of the story is that basically the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will decline precipitously, lower than the, the, the concentration levels that um, in, uh, enable trees and many other plants uh, to, to exist, to photosynthesize. A um, uh, number of million years later, um, ultimately all plants will uh, cease to be able to, uh, to, to exist. And of course, um, you know, plants are um, the, the and other primary, what are called primary producers, to so the foundation of the food web, animals and everything else uh, depends on on, on plants. Uh, so all uh, sort of life begins to, uh, the, all non-microbial life basically uh, begins to sort of fall apart at that point. Um, and then within one billion years, um, the sun has expanded to such an extent that the uh, the oceans of the earth will boil off. 
uh, which will be great fun. And then uh, really all that will be left at that point will be those sort of extremophile um, uh, microbes uh, clinging onto the, the holes and cracks of the geosphere. Um, and uh, so like for the same reason that we need to solve climate change and biodiversity loss, which is you know to protect and preserve the conditions on earth that have allowed humans to flourish. Basically it's self-preservation, it's pre preserving the species. <clears throat> um, with, at some point within the next 600 million years, we, knew, we do need to get off this rock. And in fact, because um, uh, this, these sort of processes happen throughout space, <clears throat> we want to get to as many worlds as possible, spread human consciousness as far as, as possible <clears throat> in order to maximize the uh, the chances of human consciousness remaining um, um, in the universe. I mean, I mean, the reason that I, from a non-religious perspective, find humans to be so particularly special is that we are the universe becoming aware of itself. There is no purpose in the universe outside of what what we create. Mm -hmm. um, a universe without humans is 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 a pointless universe. Um, yeah. So that's my scientific romanticism there. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I would want my descendants a billion years from now to be extreme microbes. You know, that's how that's my dying wish. Really? <laughs> I, I want them to be hard boy microbes, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take the conversation away from space for a minute. Sure. That's right. Just and kind of more like a general science point, how it relates to the left and Kale and I always joke, I always find an excuse to talk about either A. Philip Randolph or Tony Mazzocchi on each show. So I'm going to keep with that tradition. But so Tony Mazzocchi, you know, he was president of the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. And he he used science in service of his union and kind of the broader occupational safety and health movement. So, you know, a lot of these scientists who were young people from the new left, they they had a set of knowledge and technical skills that he didn't have and that his workers didn't have. And so we kind of use this to build a greater understanding of how hazards in the workplace, how to fight the boss. So, I mean, do you see kind of opportunities today for science just broadly to be, kind of be used, whether it's to aid the labor movement or the left in that kind of like concrete way? Oh, 100%. Um, I wish that the left um, and uh, in particular the green left uh, paid more attention to scientific evidence. Um, and the, the trade, because the trade union movement does, um, if you go and speak to any um, sort of workers within the energy se uh, sector, uh, the trade unions within the energy sector, they will tell you that we need um, nuclear power, um, which you guys were talking about at the, the start of the show. They will tell you that we need things like carbon capture and storage. Uh, they will tell you that we need things like advanced geothermal, which involves um, hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. Um, um, and what's really interesting about many of these uh, these technological solutions is that they also um, are high skilled, which means that they're high waged. They tend to be uh, very easily unionizable and are already unionized. Um, uh, they they are family basically they're family supporting jobs, and mm -hmm. they are very easily um, transferable from the jobs that are going to be lost as we sunset. Uh, fossil fuel production. Mm -hmm. um, it is the it these um, this scientifically informed this evidence um, based uh, version of a green new deal, which and a green new deal is the thing that we should be doing, but it should be evidence based. Um, is um, is ironically is actually the real just transition. The slapping um, uh, solar panels and roofs, and I think we should be doing that. And stuffing us, um, um, uh, you know, extra insulation into into buildings and building retrofits again, which I think we should do. Um, then these are the sort of you know the sort of th the types of things that are talked about by by many advocates of the Green New Deal. They're sixteen dollars an hour. They are not. They're unskilled. And uh, these working class communities um, and trade unions in the energy sector look at these proposals and say. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not paying any attention to the science. You're not paying any attention to the evidence. Um, and you certainly don't care about us workers because if you did, um, uh, you would actually come and speak to us first. And uh, one of the interesting things was um, 
I think it was last year, no, it was a year before because it was pre, pre-pandemic. There was a protest outside uh, the Democratic Convention in, in California um, when um, a number of private sector trade unions were protesting the idea of the Green New Deal. And you looked at their, uh, and you think, oh, that's terrible. How right-wing are they to be opposing the Green New Deal? And then you actually look at the press release and the letters that they wrote about this. And they said, we, we think the idea is fantastic. We think it's a great idea in principle, but they've never come and spoken to us. They never asked us um, what the, the, the evidence is. They aren't paying attention to science. Um, and their just transition is meaningless. Um, I just wish that uh, the green left would take its often very good economic uh, sort of analysis and marry it to a real proper science-based trade union focused um, uh, version of, of the, the Green New Deal and, and the just transition. I'm wondering, I mean, is there like a, is there either a good example that's going on right now of, of that marrying that you think should be held up as sure, like, yeah. this, we should, we should try to, uh, resemble this, or maybe even like a historical analogy. Um, although obviously, you know, can be, sometimes that's, um, not always the best, uh, route to take because, you know, History doesn't that play really out. applicable to today, for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I would give you, I would give you two examples, um, mm -hmm. contemporary examples rather than historical examples. Mm -hmm. uh, the first example I would, I would talk about would be um, uh, the folks involved with the development of the Green New Deal um, sort of proposals in Maine, in the state of Maine. Um, it, distinct from a number of other sort of Green New Deal advocates, they started by going and speaking to the trade unions in the energy sector and other sectors, other sort of uh, sectors that are affected by, uh, by, by the clean transition. And um, before they uh, developed their Green New Deal proposal for Maine. And the, the trade unions really informed that proposal, including things that, you know, they would never have thought about before because people involved in the activist think tank, NGO community, and I hold up my hand as I'm, I'm one of these people, um, uh, we are somewhat cut off uh, from, from them. And we might not think off the top of our head what, what the, 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 what's top of mind, what's the priority. And one of the main things that the, the, the trade unions were arguing at the time was like, we really, really feel that um, uh, apprenticeships um, uh, for up and coming workers, for young workers to be able to make that transition are so important. There's We'll do what we can for for us, for us old, older fogies, but we really have to make sure that um, for anybody who's coming in are, are much more able to, to make that transition um, just straight away without having to sort of um, retrain, let's say. And this was like, oh yeah, of course, that totally makes sense. And so that is um, sort of now one of the one of the key aspects of their, their set of demands. And surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, in, in Maine, there is no trade union opposition to um, to the Green New Deal proposals there because the Green New Deal proposals there are trade union proposals. Mm -hmm. So that's the first example I would say. The second I, is something that I'm involved in myself, um, which is um, there are a number of different activists around the world that are trying to work with, um, with the trade unionists, um, the workers and uh, not just the, the heads of the trade unions, but the workers themselves who work at um, uh, nuclear power plants to try to stop them from being closed down. And we have um, worker activists from um, in Ontario um, at Pickering Power Plant, uh, which is scheduled for being, uh, shut, uh, uh, being shuttered. Um, and it will be replaced by natural gas, which is crazy because Ontario has one of the lowest um, uh, carbon grids in, in the world, thanks largely to nuclear and also to hydro. Um, we're working with, uh, with American um, trade unionists. We're working with French trade unionists, um, uh, all of which are facing enormous battles at the moment um, where as a result of sort of liberalize, neoliberalization of electricity grids and um, sadly uh, sort of neoliberal focuses on wind and solar alone instead of firm sources like um, um, nuclear, geothermal and, and hydro. Um, uh, these, 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 these nuclear power plants can't compete with cheap natural gas that will back up the, uh, the solar and wind much more easily deployable in a market. Um, and, and it's really exciting because it really is sort of 
international workers coming together with scientists, with um, with with people who you know, energy systems experts. Um, I mean, it's still really early days yet, um, and but uh, that's mm -hmm. that's I think that's that's the future of um, of climate activism. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for your service. Um, always, <laughs> thank you. Like that's uh, a great place to end it. Start with labor and with labor, you know? Yeah, 100%. Right. Uh, people should read these books, uh, Austerity, Ecology, and the Collapse Born Addicts, and the People's Republic of Walmart. Um, I just want to say, Lee's like, there's like certain thinkers and writers who are just like cornerstones of my political thought and like how I think about politics and socialism. And, and Lee has been one of those people for me just personally. So I, I could just, I can listen to Lee all day. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, and if you want a little bit more, you should actually just read the Jacobin piece. We don't need Elon Musk to explore the solar system. Um, not the best title. We've we've come to a, a new consensus on. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I mean, Lee... Oscar is totally going to be like, why do you say that publicly? <laughs> you shouldn't be criticizing our copy editors. They're great. The They're amazing. The copy editors are awesome. They do a wonderful job. I love them. Yeah, we have the same impression of Oscar. Just I mean, Lee's <laughs> Lee's first title was you know his colonial manifesto. He decided to. Yeah. Uh, Pull that back, understandably. <laughs> All right, we love you, Lee. Right. We'll, we'll please see you guys. Soon. You guys are awesome. Love you, Paul. Love you, Kale. All right. See you. Take care. All right. See Bye. you. Sweet. All right. Um, well, that ending on labor was a perfect segue to labor, Paul. So, just so people know, tonight I'm not going to be taking questions like normal, but definitely still, if you have any question about um, labor politics, labor unions, labor history, put them in the chat. I will try to get to them next episode, but. We have a yeah. special guest. Use um, this hashtag. Right. So. Use the hashtag Labor Paul on Twitter or, or just tag me. Um, but we have a special guest tonight. So some of you may know that um, in Illinois and Cook County workers with SCIU Local 73 have been on strike for about the last two weeks. So we are uh, really happy to have Eugenia Harris with us tonight. She is on one of the bargaining team leaders and a worker for the Cook County Health System. So welcome. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I just want to start broad question. You know, uh, what kinds of workers does um, Local 73 represent and how long have you been a member of the union? Um, I have been a member of SEIU 73 for 18 years. That's how long I've been in county. Um, county represent, I mean, not county, SEIU 73 <laughs> represents a lot of the frontline, what county called the essential workers, um, the baseline workers. So we're at the EVS workers, the deemed housekeepers, transporters. They support the sheriff's office, some of the workers there, medical assistants, the ward clerks, phlebotomy, respiratory therapists, many of your baseline workers. They represent highways and transportation, workers at the um, offices under the president and corporate offices, workers at the courthouses that work in um that work in at the front desks and they represent pretty much practically all of your baseline workers all throughout cook county hmm. system. and before getting into kind of the current issues since you've been um you know working there for a good chunk of time like have you noticed like working conditions changing either getting better or worse over your time there worse they've worse. definitely gotten worse yes definitely it, it, in what ways? Really? Um, for instance, uh, well, we during COVID, we definitely know that it was really bad last year, but we have less and less staff. You know, um, they're putting off more work on um, less people. So um, they aren't hiring more. The turnover is horrendous. People come and they go as fast as they come, including management, um, but they cannot, keep staff and for the longevity staff that we have, you know, um, they do have some very long time workers. We have workers that have been there 44 years and that are very proud of what they do and they're happy to be there. Um, but um, people just, incoming people just are not staying, you know, like um, they used to. So um, the staffing is horrible all across Cook County, especially in the health and hospital systems. For instance, um, Many times we'll have like one health advocate, a CNA. Um, she'll be to an entire floor of patients, which is 28 mm. patients. 
Those are the worst of the worst nursing home conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, And staff is working like that, you know? Um, So yeah, staffing right now is pretty bad. We have clerks that are handling three units at one time. Um, They have nights where they have only two clerks for an entire nine unit um, floor or three CNAs for the entire hot, um, the entire nine units. It's staffing is horrible and yeah. they know it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a public school teacher in Philadelphia. And unfortunately, a lot of what you're saying regarding like the turnover or short staffing is, is very similar, you know, in mm-hmm. my line of work as well. And um, so what has it been like? I mean, since the since COVID-19 for for the, the workers in your union and yourself, uh, what has that been like working through that? It got, uh, well, I imagine you can see, no, that it got progressively worse. Um, A lot of our lives were like really turned upside down. You know, our schedules changed and um, we watched many of our coworkers go out sick, you know, for very long periods of time. We have one coworker that caught COVID twice um, during that time. Um, Some of our coworkers, we're in the hospital weeks, weeks at a time, you know, so we watched um, not just our coworkers, but watching our patients, watching the patients go through what they go through. Um, it was a very, very difficult time in that hospital, you know, to watch as things unfolded. And we saw it firsthand. We dealt with it firsthand, but it didn't stop us from coming, even though, right. you know, it was happening. It didn't stop us from filling those um, holes where we needed to be. Mm-hmm. And so what about with this contract, what are what are some of the main issues that you all are fighting for in this next contract? Definitely some of the contract language um, to just um, some of the contract language to give us a little bit more leeway there and just some better working conditions, um, language on staffing and, you know, giving us some roles or um, just including staffing so that they can staff more people. Um, language on um, growth and economics, longevity pay is a really, really crucial um, topic, you know, for the most, um, for the workers with those long years of being there, there's no reason that a 44 year worker is making the same amount or less than a worker that's been there for five years. Mm. Um, So some of those things are this. Um, a lot of this is to correct people who have been wronged, you know, by the county through last contracts. Mm. It's a lot of correcting um, prior um, issues with county that happened before. So correcting right. past sins. And I, I think I saw something in an article where they're, they're, they they want to increase healthcare costs by something like what is it eighty percent? Can can you talk a little bit about that? So they um, in, they proposed to increase um, the highest increase in um, healthcare costs would be um, up to I believe it was like eighty to ninety percent is what it would be. So it would like almost double a person's healthcare costs. And so you can imagine that for the lowest paid employees within the Cook County system. And that's what SEIU has. They have some of the lowest paid in the entire county system. Mm -hmm. Um, Many of its members are the lowest paid. So you can only imagine how much that that would hit their pay. I know a lot of people say, oh, you know, we pay more um, or we do this more. But when that hits you the way that they want it to hit you, that's a severe increase in pay for people who already just don't make that much that they're living paycheck to paycheck. Right. And it's always amazing when management brings stuff like that to the table. Like, do they really think they're going to get away with that? It's almost like they're just trying to push they you are. Know, to see how far, how far they, how can, far go. they can go. They yeah. are. <laughs> they are. They're pushing buttons and saying, oh, let's see if they'll just take this. You know, let's just see if they'll just do this. If we offer it, then, you know, um, we can just nagle them as much as we want. You know, um, right. that's kind of what's happening is lowballing as much as they can. And, you know, Chicago kind of in a way, it's one of the few kind of last like real labor cities in a way with high union density. And, you know, there has been kind of a lot of before this strike, like other strike activity, like Chicago Teachers Union, some others. Has any of that, do you see that kind of like inspiring workers now? Are they kind of like playing off of some of the strikes that have come in recent history? 
Yeah, they are. It's an encouragement. It definitely is an encouragement to um, know that the past strikes just with um, working with and workers standing up for what they deserve and, you know, standing up for what they know that they worked so hard for. It is definitely an encouragement for our members, um, even Portillo's. Um, I think that was last week. Portillo's went on strike. Right. Yeah. You know, we just smile like, yay, Portillo's, you know, no <laughs> Portillo's for a week. And most people love Portillo's. So, but, you know, it's sad to say um, that Portillo's settled, settled, to my understanding, they settled that strike fairly quickly. And here we are 13 days in in Cook County and still will not settle with its workers that have given and provided and pushed so hard for them for so, so many years. Right. Mm hmm. And, you know, since COVID, of course, there's all this talk about essential workers. And I think among the public, there really is this newfound appreciation for the people who got us through COVID. I mean, on a broader scale, like what do you think going forward needs to be done to really show all kinds of essential workers, whether they're truck drivers, healthcare workers, whatever, that they're appreciated? What would instead of just the words, what needs to change in this country going forward to really thank essential workers? Um. Again, is the the most essential workers, the people that do the most for this country, the people that actually keep this country rolling and twirling and turning, are some of the lowest paid people in our country. Um, even teachers. We, uh, I think that during COVID, I think everybody really realized how much right. teachers do. I think parents gained a whole new respect. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that my child is 27. So. <laughs> Yep, now you know, yep, we're with them every day. So. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm happy I don't have any COVID children. But I'm <laughs> sure that parents gained an entire new respect for the reality of what teachers actually face on a daily basis. You're at home with your one or two children, and they're in the classroom with your 20, 25 children in some of the worst schools. So I think that that is one of the things that needs to change. And I'm praying that that is one of the things that COVID brought about. But as we can see from Cook County, that it did not, is that the people that actually make the country turn, the people that actually make your organizations turn are the people that are paid the less and that are struggling the hardest out of all of these organizations. And it doesn't matter what you are, but like you said, truck drivers, they push through, they right. um, still got us everything that we needed. You know, um, those are the jobs that keeps us going every single solitary day. But those are the jobs and those are the people that are struggling the hardest. That's right. Um, and so just last question. I mean, what, what can people do to support y'all? You know, even if they're home, they don't live in Illinois. But, you know, what what are ways people can help out right now? You can call Tony Preckwinkle and you okay. can tell her to settle the contract. Um, the people do have a voice and that is the best thing is that being we do work for a government agency and they we work for the people, which means that Tony Preckwinkle also works for the people. So the people have a voice and the people's voice is the power. So they need to voice if they agree with this, they need to voice and say, hey, settle the contract, give them what they deserve. You've paid every other union, you've settled with every other union, you've given other unions the same thing. What is so very different about these workers that they don't deserve what everybody else is getting? What is so different about these workers that they deserve less? Did they not put in the same work? Did they not put in the same grit and grind and effort that everybody else did? So what is it about this union? What is it about these people? What is it about mm -hmm. these workers that makes you say you don't want to pay them the same thing that you have given everybody else? Um, they can definitely call in to Preckwinkle and voice their opinions. They can definitely um, light that line up and show their dissatisfaction. We also have a strike fund with SEIU to help them support the workers that are um, on the strike line. We've been on the line for 13 days with no mm -hmm. pay. Um, and there is a strike fund set up for, um, for workers um, to help us get through this time. They can definitely donate to that strike fund. But most importantly, the strike fund and using their voice. The right. people's voice is the power. Yeah, and, and that's I mean, one hope I have with this public appreciation is that more, you know, non-union people get involved in union yep. fights. So, you know, showing up to picket lines, calling, yep. 
you know, I think there's an opportunity for that. Um, but, you know, thank you so much for coming on. It was really great to hear this. We're going to do all that we can to support you all. And I really hope you all can stick it out and win a, win a good contract. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Mm, so good. Thank you, Gina. Uh, I also, I put the uh, the link uh, to cool. um, the Cook County strike in the chat so people can find it there. Uh, I'll also pin it uh, once the video is, is uh, permanently up later. Um, cool. Yeah, it's, I, know. I mean, I love just bringing uni people on. It's a good challenge almost like every week. I want to try to find, you know, someone that we can bring on. But, um, you know, it's really great to hear from people like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's amidst, you know, there's tons of awful news going on. It's, it seems like in many ways, like politics has, has been cut off for a lot of people. And yet there still are like these incredible uh, efforts of, of working people fighting back saying, no, we actually deserve more in life. Um, right. And so and it's, it's a privilege saw, to be able to host them. Right. And I saw someone in the live chat, I glanced real quick and, and someone said, you know, it's just so sad. Like people are asking for such basic things, you know, and it's like, it really is amazing when you really look into these union fights, like the ass are so modest, you know, and it's just like constantly, they're just trying to grind people into the ground. And I think a lot of people just don't realize. And, you know, I hear a lot of, um, tends to be maybe older middle class people who have this conception of like, uh, well, unions used to be useful, but now, you know, they're so corrupt and powerful. And I'm like, what world are you living in? Like even right. unionized workers have to struggle for like a 2% raise, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, what other option do working people have? I mean, that's, that's right. like what it, it comes down to. It's like, okay, sure. Like some unions need reforms, uh, you know, undoubtedly. But like the union becomes the means for working people to fight for their interests. Um, right. Until you give me a better option, that's what we got. And um, so it, it is, it's really inspiring to hear stories like uh, Eugenia's. So um, I want yeah. to say thank you again to her uh, and to her, her colleagues. Um, and maybe before signing off, Kale, we have a very exciting episode next week. Do you want to <laughs> talk about who, 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 is our, who is our guest next week? Oh boy, yeah, this is a big, um, <laughs> big shift. Um, well, so next week is uh, Bastille Day. And um, so we thought it would make the most sense to talk about the, um, the legacy of the French Revolution and of the Enlightenment and kind of how, even though it seems so very far away, certain kind of ideals have persisted into the future. And we figured there would be no better guest than to have Slavoj Žižek on to talk about revolutions. So next week, uh, uh, keep your eyes open for Zizek. Um, I can't. I can't even imagine what's going to happen. So yeah, I'm not even planning questions, Kale. I'm just telling you. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm. We could probably just ask one question and just let him go from there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll try to get. We'll try to sneak in a second one. Um, but uh, so we'll be back next week. Um, so uh, please hit like. Please hit subscribe. Please share the video. Um, if you liked what you saw, uh, share it with your friends. Maybe they'll like it. Um, but on that note, I think uh, I think we'll say good night. All right. Good night, everyone. Right. Good night.